so to give the second of the three short talks that are going to set the tone for the day, I'm delighted to welcome Johan Rockström of the Stockholm Resilience Center. <laughs> Yes. Good morning, everyone. I would argue that the most important scientific message to humanity is that we need to position food in the context of the scientific insight, number one, namely that we are now sitting on, for the first time as a first generation, on such ample evidence that humanity has shifted from being a relatively small world on a big planet where we have redundancy of freshwater, biodiversity, forests, biosphere, nitrogen, phosphorus, and atmospheric space, to having tipped over just over the past 30 years to today being a relatively large world on a small planet. We've reached a saturation point where the determination of whether we're serious about human well-being on a stable and resilient planet really resides on whether we get it right on food. And the shockwave really goes right across the entire planet. It might surprise you to talk about food and refer to the shock that came just a few days back with the observations that, well, based on the scientific insights that we know that average temperature rise on planet Earth of two degrees Celsius actually means an amplification to five degrees Celsius in the Arctic. This is something that even climate skeptics in many cases would argue is a no-go area. And then just a few weeks back, we start seeing the observations of an anomaly in the Arctic region. We get the very, very odd spike deviation of Arctic sea ice suddenly veering off, given that we see a shock of a plus 20 degrees Celsius warming pulse in the Arctic. This is beyond the predictable. This is a scientific shock. It's probably not a tipping point, but it's a warning to humanity that something is happening in this period when we are a big world on a small planet. The drama is, of course, that the complexity of these processes are increasingly understood. It's one degree Celsius warming in the atmosphere, combined with the fact that 93% of the anthropogenic climate forcing, where food is the single largest cause of energy imbalance on planet Earth, is stored in the oceans. The Earth system is so resilient, it is shoving our abuse under the carpet, trying to apply its biophysical processes to stay in Tara's Eden of Garden, the Holocene equilibrium we've been in since the last ice age. But we know also from calculations that actually the Earth resilience in the oceans, which is a source of food for a large portion of the world population, if we would release the heat that Earth resilience has stored in the oceans, it would actually mean not a one degree Celsius rise on average temperature, but a 36 degree Celsius rise of temperature since the Industrial Revolution. So we're really talking about a massive scale interference in the Earth system, and the evidence is clear. It is the hockey stick patterns of essentially every parameter that matters for our human well-being looks the same. So don't worry if you don't see what is on this graph. Just look at the pattern of the hockey stick patterns on the x-axis here you have since the Industrial Revolution, since uh, James Watt invented the coal-fired uh, engines in 1750 up until today, and you have this very gradual, gradual increase up until the mid-1950s, and then off we go in what has now been called clearly scientifically as the Great Acceleration, and we enter the Anthropocene just over the past 50 years as us now being in a new geological epoch. We are now the dominant force of change of planet Earth, and if you look at these hockey stick graphs very carefully, you'll find not only carbon dioxide, but also deforestation, loss of biodiversity, eutrophication, overuse of fresh water, land degradation, and that these factors, for one, welcomes humanity to a new geological epoch, but has all to do with food. The big scientific drama, I will argue, though, is the following. So we have been in the Edens of Garden for the past 10,000 years. We actually invented agriculture just when we left the last ice age 12,000 years ago, but it's only in the last 50 years that we exponentially put such large pressure on the Earth system that we are actually jeopardizing the entire stability of planet Earth in 50 years' time. But scientific evidence actually also shows that what happens over the next 50 years is probably what will be determining the ability for civilizations on Earth over the next 10,000 years. So the plus-minus 50-year period which is a period of only four generations, where we happen to be in the decisive generation, will probably determine 
what happens over the next 10,000 years. And food is a number one decisive factor. We have so much evidence that food is the single largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, that food is the primary cause behind loss of biodiversity, and we are entering the sixth mass extinction of species. Food is the single largest consumer of fresh water. Food is the largest source behind eutrophication overuse of nitrogen and phosphorus. You just look out of the window here and you see the Baltic Sea that probably tipped over in 1989 in the anoxic, over-eutrified state we are so familiar with today. So, to put it very simple, the scientific message is that if we get it right on food, we are very likely to get it right for planet Earth. And if we get it right for planet Earth, we stand a chance of having the possibility of delivering on the sustainable development goals and truly having a future for humanity. This is increasingly understood. There is a myriad of initiatives now rolling out, and I put up front here Tara Garnett's fantastic perspective piece in science recently. I mean, there's really a momentum recognizing that we really need to put up food, healthy and sustainable for humanity, on the top agenda of science. Because it's not only the sustainability environmental side of the coin, it really is the health factor. This graph I find is very dramatic, showing that six out of the 11 top reasons for global burden of disease originates from food. Non-communicable diseases, diabetes, overconsumption of unsustainable foods, cardiovascular diseases. If we get it right on food, we are likely to find synergies between health and sustainability. So there are new hockey sticks. The hockey sticks are not only the ones to the right here on carbon dioxide, biodiversity loss. They're actually also the hockey stick of obesity in the upper left-hand corner. The hockey stick of the fact that we're overusing antibiotics, which leads to antimicrobial resistance drama in the food system. The enormous hockey stick of rising diabetes patterns, particularly in Asia. So we are facing this double whammy with regards to unsustainable, unhealthy food systems. And therefore, we must once and for all recognize that if we're serious about the sustainable development goals that 196 countries have signed, if we're serious about the legally binding global agreement in Paris, where we're supposed to now transition into a fossil fuel free world economy by mid-century, there's no such thing as succeeding with Paris. There's no such thing as succeeding with the SDGs to having good lives for all co-citizens on Earth if we don't get it right on food. And that this actually is a global transformation. It's not an incremental journey. It's not that we can have ecological food as a little side kick in the stores and that we have a willingness to pay that might get 15%. You saw your own statistics in the beginning here to kind of be willing to be a bit more sustainable. No, we need a transition where sustainable food is the mainstream, where it should be difficult to find the unsustainable conventional foods in the stores. That the sustainable development goals, the 17 goals that we've now adopted, is a universal pathway where food forms a core part of this journey. And just to give you one link then between what we always focus on, namely climate and food. So this is the first time we try to interpret through IPCC uh, scenarios, what Paris really means, if we're serious about delivering on Paris. Well, it means, and the curve, just focus on the curve uh, on the upper side to begin with, we're today emitting 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year, that's on the y-axis. We need to bend that curve latest 2020. That's in four years' time, four years' time, we need to bend the curve of emissions of burning fossil fuels. And then you see we need to reach a point of largely zero emissions by 2050, 2060, over the next 30 years, therefore, we are to decarbonize the world economy. But look at the green and blue dots there, lines there. These are the negative emissions provided by nature. This is the enormous, gigantic subsidy to our economy by the oceans and land ecosystems taking up carbon dioxide through carbon sinks. This is Earth resilience at play. Now, we cannot deliver on Paris unless we also maintain the resilience in these ecosystems. And what you further then see on the left, right-hand side is that the brown chart there goes below zero, which means that agriculture has to become net carbon sink, because agriculture today is a net carbon source. So the summary is, if we're serious about Paris, we need to not only decarbonize the energy system, we need to manage our ecosystems through full sustainability and transition the food system from a prime carbon source to a prime carbon sink. That, dear friends, is our challenge. And that, dear friends, is this transformation to a sustainable future. 
That is why science has put up the sustainable development criteria through the planetary boundaries, which gives us a safe operating space for human development in the needles of garden type stable planet. That's why we have, you know, through scientific endeavors, made the point that food actually can be defined sustainably through these definitions. We know that food has to be a carbon sink. We know that food now has to be done in a way that halts biodiversity loss. We can no longer expand into natural ecosystems to provide food. We also know that we have to basically close the cycle of nutrients in order to have any chance of giving phosphorus for poor communities in Africa. We know that water productivity needs to be improved so we don't have a loss in ecosystem resilience in the large river basins. So we can actually define scientifically the criteria for sustainable food in the future. We also know that this changes quite a lot of the perspectives of how we move forward on economics. We just recently did a scientific review for the Global Environment Facility showing that in the Anthropocene, we need to rethink the global commons. We need to internalize all externalities. In fact, even for a finance minister in this country, Sweden, it matters whether the Amazon rainforest is stable because it regulates the entire climate system. And therefore, we cannot just import soya as a, a feed for livestock without considering the real planetary costs. We need to maintain all the biomes, that these systems that we talk of normally as being kind of ethical responsibilities actually regulate the entire stability of the Earth system and that the food system is fundamentally coupled exactly to the works of these biomes. Again, we see more recognition of this both in private sector and here just a whole series of different examples of how this is coming increasingly into societal dialogue. We have recently actually, based on all this science, through the Lancet Commission, which is an effort of doing a mini IPCC to try and say, what does science say in quantitative terms of how we can define healthy and sustainable food systems? Also, juggled with the idea that we may have to simply reconfigure the sustainable development goals into a wedding cake. Of course, a healthy wedding cake which is that among the 17 sustainable development goals, we have four planetary boundaries that scientifically can be argued should be non-negotiable. The biodiversity, the fresh water, the climate, and the, fresh and the, and the nutrient uh, poor positioning of the boundaries. And within the safe operating space, we can deliver successfully on food, on human well-being, on equity, and economic development. This is, of course, very challenging to accept that we now need to respect biophysical boundaries on planet Earth. But it can be one of the challenging discussions in a meeting like this. Transforming to global sustainability and delivering on food means building resilience. It's not enough just to optimize and having kind of yield increase and productivity increases. We must now recognize the need for building resilient systems across the food system. Science shows that we can actually deliver sustainable, resilient food for a growing population. So the window is open. Agriculture can turn from a source of challenge to a source of solution. The Lancet Commission is therefore trying to provide science-based definition along these axes of sustainable or unsustainable food, unhealthy, healthy food, and what does science say of us moving to the upper right-hand corner where we have synergies between healthy and sustainable food. That's the core of the Lancet Commission. It will be coming out in, at the EAT Forum for the first time in June next year and to be published by the end of 2017. And to close, therefore, the EAT initiative is an example of an effort of getting science, business and policy to focus on the transformation to sustainable healthy food systems. So my concluding remarks, therefore, is that if we're serious about our transformation to a sustainable future, it is about sustainable and healthy food systems as a necessity to be able to deliver on the SDGs and Paris. So if we get it right on food, we're likely to get it right for people and planet. Thank you very much.